if you've ever been anywhere near a radio, you are familiar with the music of the Grassroots. From 1967 to 1972, the Grassroots set a record for being on the Billboard charts 307 consecutive weeks. I'm very excited to be here with one of the members, one of the guys who played, wrote, and sang some of our favorite songs, Dennis Provisor. Dennis, thanks for taking a few minutes out of your busy day to talk with us. No problem. When you joined the band in 1969, yeah. they were already kind of an established hit-making machine. Uh, they had already done Let's Live for Today, uh, Midnight Confessions, I think. How did it feel to be joining that? Was there some trepidation on your part to be the new kid? Well, I was I was on the road, you know, ten years prior to that with different, uh, more like rhythm and blues type mm -hmm. bands and psychedelic bands and stuff like that. So, you know, some of my friends said, "Oh, you're selling out. You know, you're going to be a a pop star. You're, you're selling. You're, you're not going to do the heavy stuff anymore and okay. stuff like that." So I, I I heard you know talk like that, right. but I said, "Well, you know." It's about time that you know, this paid off. <laughs> right. And was that a challenge for you, uh, juggling the two roles of being a serious musician and a personality? Is that something you didn't want to sign up for? That's when the songwriting started. Right. So all of my serious musician musicianship turned into songwriting. Okay. You know, and uh, so I, so I spend lots of time songwriting. Well, now, c correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, when the grassroots were formed, they were originally sort of a vehicle for other people's songs. When you came aboard, even right off the first album, you were able to get some of your compositions onto the albums. Right. Was, right. That, was that you were just because of your experience as a songwriter, or did you uh, insist on that? No, I didn't insist on it. I just had some songs that they thought, you know, were good songs. Okay. A lot of them weren't big hits. You know, Walking Through the Country did pretty good, and... Uh, Glory Bound did pretty good. Well, and how much uh, how much creative freedom were you guys given in the studio? Were you able to uh, get your voice heard as much as you wanted? I remember, you know, that we asked for more creative freedom, mm -hmm. and and uh, Jay Lasker, who ran ABC Dunhill, told us that we were just a bunch of college dropouts, and we were lucky to be where we were. So <laughs> may have been some truth in that too, you know. I mean, you were, regardless of uh, the the uh, conditions, you were lucky to be where you were. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we did. We had, we had there was some great writers over at Dunhill, mm -hmm. Price and Walsh, uh, Lambert and Potter, Lambert and Potter. Don't pull your love out on mm -hmm. me, baby, and uh, Gary Zeekley, who did sooner or later. Okay. And I remember Gary Zeekley coming over over my house. I didn't know who he was, mm -hmm. but I get this knock at the door, you know, seven in the morning, and this greasy little guy comes in. Listen, you got to hear this song, and I, you know, I'm half asleep. I go okay, and he comes in and he plays sooner or later. And I, as soon as he played that, I got on the phone to. Warren and Grill, and I said, "Hey, man, you got you guys got to hear this thing." You knew it was a hit. And I said, "That's it. I mean, that's yeah. it. It's like it's 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 uh, it's amazing." We cut it the next day, and the next day it was like number five. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> TV show that uh, featured music back in the day. I found a clip on YouTube of you guys doing Walking Through the Country on Hugh Hefner's show, Playboy After Dark. Right. Now, I know you're a nice Wisconsin family man these days, so I won't ask you to go into detail, but can you tell me the after party was everything I dreamed it would be? Okay. I thought it was everything I dreamed it would be also. Yeah. But what that was, Playboy After Dark was done in some kind of a studio in Chicago. That was not the Playboy Mansion, unfortunately. Okay. You guys were huge. As I mentioned, you were on the charts, on the radio all the time. The Grassroots were a household name at the time. What do you remember most about that, that sort of Beatlemania madness period? 
for for us it was you were if you were on the charts and you had a hit record you were you know working mm -hmm. and the work would fall off as the song would fall off wow so we had to keep producing and for some reason we just kept coming out with hit after hit after hit in fact i have a you know uh cash box that says grassroots sprout hit after hit or something like that we just got on a roll you know where where you, where you went from uh i'd wait a million years and then we did uh then sooner or later and two divided by love and temptation eyes mm -hmm. and it just kept going heaven knows that it just kept going and going mm -hmm. you know one after the other we were we were always on the charts Albums for you guys, it seemed from the record company standpoint, were almost an afterthought. I mean, you would release hit singles and they would later be packaged together on an album with some other songs. Right. Uh, one of the great travesties in my mind, uh, the finest grassroots album ever recorded, in my opinion, was Move Along, which you played all over, you sang lead on a couple songs, you wrote the title song fantastic album but because it didn't come out until after you had left the band you're not credited on the album as being a member of the band well see that was the that was the problem uh, when I left the band they tried to kind of erase the memory of Dennis Provisor because there was such a it was such a hassle when I left it was it was uh, big problems but anyway so they they hired a couple other guys, mm -hmm. you know, to replace me. But if you look at the album, I wrote like probably half or three quarters of that album. Mm -hmm. I've been mm -hmm. been with the this band called the Hits now for about thirty years, and these are all clean guys, and they're all tremendous musicians, and they actually work for a living. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And I said, this is these guys are good and they play good and it's clean and I'm not going to get in any trouble here. <laughs> I like to fish. Beer is cheap. It, it's a beautiful place. It, re it really is. What's LA it? became, LA at that time in 74 when I left, became so crowded and so smoggy and mm -hmm. so crazy that mm -hmm. that it was time to go anyway. Well, now, But now, okay, so you've been playing with the hits um, for the past 30 years or so. I imagine you're still writing songs. I don't think that doesn't seem to be something you just flip a switch and turn it on. Yeah, I, I write songs all the time. Okay. Oh, and yeah. is your stuff, do you think your stuff is uh, comparable to what you were writing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't, I haven't really put any out. Well, now there's the problem. <laughs> we play it live. People request it live. You know what I mean? And people know all this, all my songs. Well, I've got you on the spot now on tape. Can we get you to? Uh, there are certainly lesser talents putting out CDs these days, Dennis. It's not that hard to do. I know you have keyboards. How about recording a CD? No, I could do that. Okay. Kevin here, he's going to do that. You should do that, really. I could do that. There's still an audience for uh, Dennis Provisor music. Um, now let's let's talk about your son, uh, Ben. Okay. Tell me, uh, he was in the Olympics recently for uh, wrestling this past summer? Yeah, we just came back from London. He, he's been wrestling since he was seven. You know, he's got a lot of, not a lot of national titles, Pan American titles. He's been one of the best, you know, wrestlers in Wisconsin. And he's just an incredible talent. Uh, and so he won the Olympic trials and we just, we just went crazy you know, oh, yeah. when he did. So we went over to London. Unfortunately, he didn't do too well in, in London. He beat the Cuban and lost to the Georgian. But uh, he did beat the last Olympic champion, you know, about about four months ago or so. He beat the last gold medal winner, which was, I would probably, one of his best wins. Now, did you step in and give him some lectures about the fleeting value of fame and that sort of thing and yeah but, the moment. but nothing you know you, you just can't you try to tell him I said now look you know everybody's going to be kissing your butt they're going to tell you you're the greatest thing in the world and you're going to believe it and pretty soon you're not going to be who you really are and that's the mistake you make and you know I think a lot of things just kind of go in one ear and out the other until you really experience what that's like. You have a daughter as well, I understand she's musical? I have a daughter that's got an amazing voice. 
In fact, we're working. We we work a club over here every once in a while, and we play we play out every once in a while. She's got this just unbelievable sound. I imagine she will be on the new CD that Dennis is going to be releasing very soon. Actually, she should be because I've written a lot of songs for her that she does. Well, now I, I know you're a busy man. We're not going to keep you much longer. But do you do you have a favorite memory of the grassroots time? The the whole madness and. Uh... Well, you know, we were on the road. We'd be on the road for two, three months at a time, from a, you know, from the plane to the hotel to the arena to the plane to the hotel to. That's it. We went all over. You okay. Know? Uh, but one time, me and the drummer were sitting in the bar and we missed the plane. And so, the only we had these were two big gigs. One was in Atlanta and one was in Alabama somewhere or something. Big gigs, you know, and like we're talking like you know, fifteen, twenty thousand people. And I, I, I called up, you know, Rob, and I said, "Man, I said we missed the plane." I said, "What do I do?" I said, "I, I did, you know, how, how am I going to get to the gig?" He goes, "I don't care how you get there, but you get there somehow." So I looked, and I was going thinking of renting a DC-10 or something, <laughs> <laughs> and that was like ten thousand dollars an hour or something. So. What I wound up doing was I rented uh, Elvis Presley's plane. He had a Lear jet. Really? And it was, it, you, you walked inside and he it had two pilots, you know, you walked inside and the door was signed by Johnny Mathis and Barbara Streisand and all the people that went on this thing. And so he said, you know, you'd be there. So I said, okay, so we rented this. <laughs> This Learjet. Oh. So we didn't make much of a profit on right. the tour. Right. But you got to the gig. <laughs> oh, that's great. Did you sign the door? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. Sure. <laughs> All right. Well, Dennis, again, we're, we're really happy that, to, that you took some time out of it. I'm really happy that things worked out for you the way they did. Wisconsin is a beautiful place. It sounds like you have a wonderful family, and you've achieved success on, on the most important level of your life. And, again, thanks for the music, and we appreciate it. Hey, thank you very much. With a ring from a flower, and a flower just won't grow.